This is my first video update coming to you from Athens, Greece on this Saturday morning. Let's talk about some news. We got some more Twitter files that are being posted on the Twitter account of Matt Taibbi. And uh, in this latest segment of the Twitter files, we are, we are getting an understanding as to, uh, as to how a small group of Twitter top executives we're moving to uh, deplatform Trump. We get the whole story as to how they, how they eventually uh, deplatformed a sitting U.S. president, and you can get an understanding from the Slack messages that the top executives were exchanging. Basically, Roth and uh, and uh, Gadai. You get an understanding that they were going to uh, to deplatform Trump no matter what, whether you had a January 6 or no January 6. The momentum was already there, and and there was this big ideological push, almost kind of like a possession, to uh, to eventually deplatform Trump. And uh, weeks and months before the actual deplatforming took place on January 8th. They were already uh, censoring Trump and shadow banning him and deamplifying his tweets and stuff like that. So the momentum was there and all they needed was, was the excuse to do it. And they got it with uh, the January 6th. And then they banned him on January 8th. They deplatformed a sitting US president. Boy, these executives have done a lot of damage to the uh, United States of America. I mean, a lot of damage. Anyway, that's the first big uh, revelation. The second big revelation is, uh, is how closely the FBI was working with these top executives at Twitter. I mean, the FBI should have just had a corner office at Twitter because, I mean, they were working with Twitter very, very closely. And they were uh, basically uh, telling Twitter what to... Uh, what to post, what to not post, what to censor, what to delete, what to ban with regards to the, uh, to the elections. And um, the interesting part about all of this is that according to the Twitter files, the, uh, the moderation, the requests for censoring came from the, uh, from the Biden camp, from the Democrat camp and Matt Taibbi says that there were no requests for moderation with regards to content and to tweets from the Republicans and from the Trump campaign. Examining the entire election enforcement, Slack, Slack is the messaging system, we didn't see one reference to moderation requests from the Trump campaign, the Trump White House or Republicans generally, Taibbi noted. While they may exist, they were absent from the files provided. So. There may be requests from the Trump campaign and, and from the Republicans towards Twitter to censor, but so far, Matt Taibbi hasn't found any documents uh, showing that. It's all in one direction. That should come as no surprise. So those were the two big uh, takeaways from, uh, from this latest Twitter files uh, post. And from what I understand, we're going to get another big, uh, big thread on Sunday, I believe. But, um, you know, the FBI working very, very closely with Twitter to, to influence certain, uh, certain events in 2020. And uh, Trump, they had, they had Trump targeted way before the actual uh, deplatforming took place on January 8th. And uh, boy, were these Twitter executives. They were uh, drunk with power, that's for sure. Children with dynamite. They are children with dynamite, and they have caused a lot of damage to the United States of America. Anyway, um, Russian President Vladimir Putin, he is in uh, the Kyrgyz capital of uh, Bishkek, and he is attending a summit of the Eurasian Economic Union, and he gave a, a press conference where he said some very interesting things. The first thing he talked about was uh, Angela Merkel and the revelation from uh, Merkel that uh, she, was, uh, she was lying 
to Putin, to the Russians, when they signed up for the uh, Minsk agreements, when they decided to, to be a party to help enforce the Minsk agreements. And uh, the only thing that the Minsk agreements were, uh, were used for, according to Merkel, was to buy Ukraine time so that it could build up their forces and eventually goad Russia into a conflict. And so Putin gave some uh, interesting remarks with regards to that revelation from Angela Merkel, a revelation where Merkel pretty much says that Minsk was all about buying Ukraine time, and Putin used that, that word, that she was just buying time for Ukraine. And he said their point was only to load up Ukraine with weapons and prepare it for hostilities. We see that. Honestly, we may have realized that too late and maybe should have started all this sooner. Putin also said, I thought other participants in that process were honest. Turns out they too were deceiving us. And this is in reference to the fact that uh, Poroshenko pretty much said the same thing. And he, he actually made this revelation a couple of months ago. So it's really interesting. You have two people involved in the Minsk agreements, in those negotiations, confirming two separate sources, confirming that the Minsk agreements, the reason they... Uh, they went along with Minsk was so that they could buy Ukraine time so that it could arm up and eventually start a conflict with, uh, with Russia or goad Russia into some sort of conflict. Two separate sources, Poroshenko and Merkel. That's pretty definitive to have two, two different people at the event admitting that the Minsk Accords was all a big con job scam. Anyway, Putin was not happy with it at all. And he said that uh, negotiating with the, with the West now, the collective West is, is useless. Trust, he says, is at zero. And that is a quote, trust at zero. The deception about Minsk now raises a question of trust, Putin said. He said it is almost at zero. That is the direct quote, almost at zero. He said, in the end, there will have to be lots of talks. We are ready for them. I have said that many times, but it does make us think who we're dealing with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, he also talked about the comment that he made a couple of days ago where he said that the, the conflict, the special military operation is going to be a lengthy process. He clarified that, that statement, and uh, he said that he was referring not to the actual war on the, on the ground, not to the actual military operation, the conflict, but the entire process. He said that, uh, referring, he said that he was referring to the resolution of the conflict in Ukraine. The special military operation is proceeding apace. Everything is stable. There are no questions or problems with it today. Resolving the whole situation will probably not be easy and will take some time. But one way or another, all participants in this process will have to agree with the realities that are taking shape on the ground. I thought that's an interesting statement too. It's going to take some time. The entire process is going to take some time. But at the end of the day, everyone is going to have to accept the realities on the ground. I wonder what those realities are going to look like in a few months. And I wonder if the collective West is really going to be able to accept those realities on the ground. He also uh, mentioned the Griner boot um, prisoner exchange. And he said that uh, he got a question um, with regards to any, any more prisoner exchanges taking place. And uh, he said, yes, everything is possible. This is the result of negotiations and the search for compromise. In this case, a compromise was found. He also, he also said there are no 
considerations for another call up, another mobilization. There's no uh, no talk about that. He um, he also okay. This is a great one, and I'll wrap up his uh, summary of what he said. He was also asked about Joseph Burrell's statement with regards to uh, to Africa. Uh, Africa's uh, most countries in Africa, their support of Russia in this conflict. And Burrell made a bonehead statement where um, he said, he said that Africans perhaps don't know where Donbass is or who Putin may be. So that's how Burrell, the EU foreign policy chief, you know, the guy that said Europe is a, is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle. That clown, well, he explained away the support of many African nations for Russia as, as African nations just not knowing where Donbass is. They have no idea. In other words, they're ignorant, right? They're just not smart enough, according to Burrell, to know where Donbass is or who Putin is. They don't know how evil, <laughs> what a mastermind of evil Putin is. <laughs> That's what Burrell is saying in order to excuse away the... Uh, the support that African nations have for, uh, for Russia. And so Putin addressed that. And uh, let me get to, to his quote here. He said that EU politicians should stop talking about their love for the African peoples and start helping these countries. If the people you spoke about knew where Africa was and what condition the peoples of Africa were in, they would not interfere with the supply of Russian food and fertilizer to the African continent on, on which the harvest in African countries ultimately depends and the salvation of hundreds of thousands of people in Africa from starvation. So that's how Putin replied to, uh, to Burrell's bonehead comment. I like that statement. If if, uh, polit if the EU would stop virtue signaling, is basically what he's saying, stop talking about their love for the African people, in other words, their virtue signaling, and start helping the countries, then they wouldn't be looking to, to pillage them all the time, is pretty much what Putin is saying. You talk about how much you love Morel. You talk about your love for, uh, for the countries of Africa, but all you do is, uh, is steal from them. And <laughs> talk down to them, steal from them. You don't really help them. Actions, where are your actions? So I thought that was a good, uh, a good comment from Putin. And another bonehead comment from Burrell. Why do they employ this guy? By the way, since we're on the topic of Burrell, Mr. Burrell is, uh, is involved in some uh, funny business. He is involved in some funny business. He gets a salary from, uh, from the EU. And I'm trying to see if I have the exact amount here. Let's see. So he's on the payroll of the EU. No big surprise there. And I think he's making something like 17,000 euros a month. Something like that. 17, 18,000 euros a month. And that's what he gets as, as just his salary. Who knows what other perks <laughs> are, are connected to the, uh, to the position. But um, not only is he getting a salary, but he's also drawing a pension from the EU Parliament. And from what I understand, this pension is coming from a fund that is, uh, that is pretty much bankrupt. Like this fund has no money in it. But, um, or it's in debt. This fund is in debt. And he's pulling money out of there as a pension. So he's drawing a salary. Ah, here we go. He's drawing a salary of 17,260 pounds GBP as a representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs. But on top of that, Borrell receives a pension linked to his work in the Euro European Parliament, confirmed a spokesman for the head of the European diplomacy and it's from a fund it's from the the european diplomatic corps it's a fund which which has debts of 345 million pounds writes the times a pension from a fund with debts of 345 
million pounds, and Burrell is pulling, pulling a pension from, from there as well. So he's getting paid a salary, and he's getting a pension from a fund that has no, uh, no money. <laughs> That's in debt. Don't worry about it. Just, just take out, if you're the European Union, just take out an 18 billion euro loan, so then you can loan it to, uh, to Alensky. Don't worry about the fact that you have pension funds that are 345 uh, million pounds uh, in the hole. <laughs> the perfect time to lend 18 billion uh, pounds to Alensky, right? What a bunch of... Uh... Ah, anyway, I'm not going to say it. I am not going to say it. There is another EU Parliament vice president who has been busted on corruption. And this is a Greek VP, a Greek representative of the European Parliament, and she is a vice president of the EU Parliament. And there was this big sting operation that took place in Belgium from the Belgium police and authorities, the Belgium Federal Judicial Police. And they say that this Greek MP, Eva, Eva Kali, Actually, I remember her, Eva Kali, Basok, a Basok MP. I believe she was doing like, at one time, a long time ago, she was on TV. I think she was a TV anchor, if I'm not mistaken, for a TV channel antenna. If my memory serves me correct, or mega, I don't know. She was a TV anchor. Yeah, Eva, Eva Kali. Anyway, uh, she became a parliament member, of course, media, politics, <laughs> no big surprise there for uh, the party Basok, which is a socialist. Allegedly, they're a socialist party. They're a globalist party. They're a globalist WEF type of party. Um, and she was uh, getting money, allegedly, allegedly, according to the Belgium authorities, she was getting money from uh, Qatar. And uh, she was talking up how good Qatar is before the World Cup. And she was she was voting against human rights abuses resolutions from the EU Parliament that they were trying to put to pass against Qatar as well. And the amount of money that is in play here is, according to Belgian police, they have confiscated 600,000 euros in cash as well as computer equipment and cell phones and stuff like that. The Central Anti-Corruption Office said in a statement. A Gulf country, they have suspected a Gulf country of, influence, of influencing MEPs with substantial sums of money or significant gifts to third parties with influence over lawmakers. That's the actual statement. So that's what's uh, going on there with corruption in the EU. And Basok has already reacted to the news by announcing Kali's expulsion, according to the Greek newspaper Gathi Merini. They said they're appalled by the allegations and would fully cooperate with all investigating authorities. They're appalled. How could Greek MPs be corrupt? This is impossible. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we invented corruption. <laughs> Greek politicians invented corruption. That's our, uh, <laughs> that's our expertise. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I laugh at the statements when they say, we're appalled. How could this happen? Yeah, I wonder how come the Belgian police aren't investigating uh, money being paid out. It's possible money or favors or funds being paid out by, I don't know, to MEPs in, in the EU, to, I don't know, by uh, Soros or Soros NGOs or, I don't know, maybe, maybe Alensky Ukraine <laughs> NGOs that are connected to all of this stuff. Uh, I don't know, is it, isn't Vander Crazy involved in something that has to do with, with her family and, and certain treatments? I have to be careful what I say and, and stuff like that. But no, let's not, let's not go into those details. Let's go after Qatar. And you know why you're, they're going after Qatar, don't you? We all know why they're going after Qatar. Well, because Qatar took a very hard line stance against uh, those EU values at the World Cup. So now they have to have to go after Qatar and, and paint Qatar as this corrupt country that is paying uh, bribes to, to, EU to EU politicians, which I'm sure they are. 
but uh, I'm sure what's coming from Qatar is is nothing compared to the amount of uh, of investment connected to Project Ukraine that is going to the EU or the other project that we had a year or two ago. Billions of EU assistance going to Ukraine are not free, they're loans, which Ukraine will default on, and they come with neoliberal strings attached. If you listen to The Economist, Ukraine is marked for a nightmare round of shock therapy, a sell-off of public land, deregulation of labour, sale of public assets, on it goes. The country's future is being sold to finance a proxy war that's tearing it apart. And of course the loans have preconditions that Ukraine must uphold democracy and rule of law, but since the tap was turned on, Zelensky has banned most opposition parties, shuttered the media, attacked trade unions and workers' rights, but the billions keep flowing. This is a country, our Court of Auditors have said, was a country accused of grand corruption. And on it goes while the EU policy seems designed to prevent peace and keep the war going at all costs as long as ordinary people pay. So between Russian tanks and European banks, there will be little left of Ukraine when this is over. Don't forget, war is a racket and there's going to be hell to pay for this one. That is the video, guys, the Duran.locals.com. Look for us on Rockfin as well in the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.